Is it just me? Or does the evolutionary tree seem more like an orchard? I would say that it's just you, but it's not even you. No one believes that. Not really. Though many try to pretend. And that's why when creationists argue for this alleged orchard of created kinds, they adamantly refuse to define whatever they think that's supposed to mean. All right, let's see if we can do this. Nope, that doesn't stay up. No, you've got to stay, stay. Hey Jane. So, gotta be honest, I haven't really had a chance to study too much. We know this. <laughs> like, we're aware of this. Uh-huh. But... Jane! Sorry. I was just taking a break. I got this new makeup case and I'm having a hard time figuring out where to put everything. Now, I could put this lipstick here. Or no. No, no, no. No. Put I'll handle lips. this. Have you noticed that in every episode of the series, they alternate between which of these kids is supposed to be instructing the other, which seems to be a fair way to do this script. But the way it's written, it always turns out that by the end, we see that John knows more than Jane about whatever it is, even when it comes to how to arrange her makeup. So we could organize it as simplest to most complex. Or by color. Ugh. See, organization just is not my thing. Once my little sister asked me to organize all her little tiny plastic animals, it took me two days. Organizing animals? <laughs> it's like Carl Linnaeus. Who's that? Yeah, he was the first guy to classify animals. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I remember him now. Um, his motto was, God created, Linnaeus ordered. Yeah, his work is the basis for the classification system we still use today. Yeah, later, Charles Darwin sketched a diagram to show how life started simple and then branched out to every creature on Earth. Uh, he said the different branches represent the different levels of classification. A tree of life, if you will. Well, in point of fact, Carl Linn, also known as Carolus Linnaeus, was the one who discovered the tree. His systematic classification of life did not reveal the separate boxes of created kinds that everyone expected to see. He started by categorizing plants and noticed that every group was nested within one of a few parent categories, which in turn was nested in a succession of ancestral groups, like a set of Russian dolls, if each doll had two or more daughter dolls instead of just one. This created a branching pattern like a taxonomic tree of life. And then he moved on to animals and noticed the same pattern again, where the most generalized forms were at the base and more specialized groups out at the endpoints. And this was not what he expected. Now, centuries before the Bible was even written, a number of Greek philosophers had already considered that all life was probably related, though they didn't know how. And some of them, like Aristotle, for example, imagined a sort of evolutionary ladder with higher and lower forms. And Linnaeus used that language, too, even when describing people, unfortunately. But what he discovered is that taxonomy is more like a tree. The part that perplexed him was that this sort of apparent descent could not happen without new species appearing repeatedly in succession. But Linnaeus believed that new species could only come about as an act of special creation by God. Thus, Linnaeus viewed his own system as a mystery that he could not account for. And then another century or so later, Darwin explained the origin of species by means of natural selection, answering Linnaeus' quandary. Only then did taxonomy suddenly make sense. Oh, yeah. I keep seeing this over and over again in our textbooks. Really? Yeah. Uh, huh, here we go. Check out this one. Are researchers still trying to figure out how it happened? Of course. And there's quite a lot to figure out there. Millions of species, with each one having dozens of interconnecting nodes just for the named clades. And then considering how they connect to every other clade... That's a lot to evaluate, especially when you can't just make something up and you need to get it right. There are a lot more of these diagrams. I think they change as different researchers group them based on different features. If we look at a fossil lineage like pterosaurs, for example, experts collectively agree on one of two schemes that they could have followed, but we can't yet confirm which of them is correct because we don't have their DNA. So the only way to resolve this is with additional data from even more fossils. It used to be that way throughout all of taxonomy, because it was based entirely on morphology. But now it's a twin-nested hierarchy because of the inclusion of molecular evidence, wherein we can trace the genome of living organisms to confirm past relationships. 
These charts show groups of organisms they believe share a common ancestor. Yeah, a group like that is called a clade. And these diagrams are called cladograms. Hmm. Man, and I thought organizing my makeup was hard. <laughs> so do they. Huh. Well, not your makeup, classifying animals. Okay, so remember that modern evolutionary classification is a rapidly changing science with a difficult goal. To present all life on a single evolutionary tree. As evolutionary biologists study relationships among taxa, they regularly change not only the way organisms are grouped, but also sometimes the name of groups. Remember that much of taxonomy was already established before evolution was confirmed, and that the construct of Linnaean taxonomy being designed by a creationist wasn't built to include evolution either, so there have been some growing pains in that regard. For example, Carolus Linnaeus was a pre-Darwinian Christian, and he was, as John and Jane pointed out, a creationist, having no idea that evolution was even possible, and believing that every species was a special creation by God. And Linnaeus divided our species, Homo sapiens, into four subspecies. American red people, Asian yellow people, African black people, and European white people, which of course he described as being superior to the rest of humanity. Remember that Linnaeus codified the language of anthropology for the next century and a half until Charles Darwin and Franz Boas both said no, that there is only one race of humans. But Linnaeus thought that there were four races or subspecies of humans. And in addition to Homo sapiens, us, he thought that there were two other species of humans, which he called Homo troglodyte and Homo nocturnus, which are chimpanzees and orangutans, respectively. Europeans didn't know about gorillas yet, or he would have classified them as human, too. Now, the scientific community in 1735 was entirely religious, and they did not like to think of chimpanzees and orangutans as human, even though the name orangutan means old man of the forest. So clearly, the locals in Borneo had no problem thinking of orangutans as humans, but of course, Christians have to declare their unique superiority and dominion over everyone else, while also pretending to be persecuted. So this is one of those times, like Jane just mentioned, when they changed the names of taxonomic groups. Homo troglodyte became pan troglodyte and pan bonobo, and orangutans became pongo pygmaeus, pongo ebelii, and pongo tapanoensis. In fact, all living ape species end up being classified as the genus Pongo, just to give the appearance that they were in a separate genus apart from the genus Homo. The Pongo was an arbitrarily contrived category for all humanoids except for humans themselves. But saying all of them except for us is a Freudian admission that you already know that we are one of them. Linnaeus protested this taxonomic revision, saying, I demand of you and of the whole world that you show me a generic character, one which is according to the generally accepted principles of classification, by which to distinguish between man and ape. I myself most assuredly know of none. I wish somebody would indicate one to me. But if I had called a man an ape and vice versa, I would have fallen under the ban of all ecclesiastics. It may be that as a naturalist, I ought to have done so. Of course, modern science has since confirmed that Linnaeus was right about that. At first, there were several dozen ape species in the fossil record that challenged the arbitrary classification of Pongo, with many examples that show clear transitions intermediate between the categories of apes and humans. The final straw was when genomic comparisons proved that humans really are nested with the other apes. So the categories had to change names again. And now all the great apes, including humans, are in the family Hominidae, and the genus Pongo has become a subset of that, reserved only for living and extinct species of orangutans and the like. Remember that cladograms are visual presentations of hypothesis about relationships and not hard and fast facts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying our textbooks say that cladograms are based off hypotheses, not facts. Yeah, I'll show you why. No, I will, Jane, because you don't know. This is what differentiates a science like evolution from a religious belief. While every religion asserts baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact, often claiming absolute proof when they don't even have the slightest evidence, scientists recognize how dishonest all that is. So they do the very opposite, treating some facts as if they are merely hypotheses. And remember that science is an investigation, not an assumption like religion is. Science is not a belief system. Encouraging conviction? 
tends to close the mind to further possibilities or make us blind to errors needing correction. Rather, the goal of science is to improve understanding. The only way to do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perception and correct them. And you can't do that if you won't admit that there even could be any flaws to correct. So rather than dictating any particular belief, science requires that we compare hypotheses to see which ones are better supported by the evidence. For example, there was a time when early taxonomists thought that aardvarks, anteaters, and pangolins must be closely related, not just because they all eat ants, but because none of them had any teeth. And now, if science operated the way religion does, then some authority would decree that these three species belong in the clade Edentata, and that anyone who ever dared argue otherwise would be branded a heretic and maybe burned at the stake. However, science works exactly opposite of faith, where those who successfully challenge the status quo are the ones who become famous and respected in history. Now, science has experts, but no authorities, and no doctrine. As the late great Carl Sagan said, in science, the only sacred truth is that there are no sacred truths. All assumptions must be critically examined. Arguments from authority are worthless. Whatever is inconsistent with the facts, no matter how fond of it we are, must be discarded or revised. Hence, science must bow to new evidence. In the case of pangolins, aardvarks, and anteaters, that new evidence once again came in the form of genetic tests, which confirmed and corrected their phylogeny, showing that pangolins were actually more closely related to carnivorans, surprisingly, and that aardvarks were more closely related to elephants, being members of the clade Aphrotheria, while anteaters belonged to the clade of South American mammals called Xernarthrans. Genetics provided the facts and evidence which determined that these clades exist. Flip forward a page. That's because they only have living animals or fossils for certain places on the branches. These are real animals or fossils we've actually discovered. But these branching points are just imaginary lines that represent the hypotheses about which animals evolved from a common ancestor. Those lines are not imaginary. In many instances, they are determined or confirmed genetically, just like we showed in the case of anteaters, aardvarks, and pangolins. These lines are verifiably real. It's like if you check your ancestry through DNA and you're surprised to find that 12 to 14 percent of your genome comes from an unexpected source, from a continent you never knew you were connected to, that your known relatives never told you about. Maybe they didn't know about it themselves. You can try to deny it, pretend it doesn't mean anything, but you already know how conclusive DNA evidence is and what the possibly, potentially uncomfortable implications are. <laughs> 15% sub-Saharan African. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey. Hold on. Just wait a minute. Hey. So. This is called statistical noise. Sweetheart, you have a little black in you. Yes. Yes. Listen, I'll tell you this. Oil and water don't mix. So, hey, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. No facts support them that can't also support different links, or no links. False. The facts supporting any link have little, if any, flexibility. It's possible that an animal might be in a different genus than originally expected, but not likely a different family, and certainly not a different order. And there have never been any facts that could support no links. That's just Jane, or rather her scriptwriters, making shit up. The transitional fossils they represent have never been found. Yes, they have, in abundance in most instances, having not just one intermediate species, but sometimes several sequential series of them. Jane is looking at an illustration in her textbook that shows how these fossil species are transitional. But she suffers from the same condition John has, where she doesn't understand what she reads, not even when you draw her a picture. If they were, well, we'd see their pictures here, right? Wrong. Science is another one of those rules against assertions of belief such that we are not allowed to identify any particular species as being directly ancestral to another, only that they are potentially so. And for example, Darwin predicted and described two transitions that have indeed been found. He said that if birds had evolved from dinosaurs, then we should find a more primitive type of bird than anything alive today, and that it should have unfused wing fingers bearing the grasping claws of a dinosaur like Velociraptor. And just a couple of years later, German quarrymen discovered 
Archaeopteryx lithographica, nicknamed Archie, which exactly matched the description Darwin gave. It was basically a small dinosaur with flight feathers, proving the transition from reptiles to birds. I think we found a dozen or more individuals from that species so far, apart from Archie. So which one of them was the ancestor of all birds? In fact, we've since found several different species of Peruvian dinosaurs that all match the description Darwin gave. And one of those other ones, like, like Rahone Avis, maybe, might be the ancestor of all birds instead of Archie. And maybe Archie is just a side branch of primitive flying dinosaurs that never became full birds. We don't want to say that anything is true today that might turn out to be false tomorrow. So we want to be careful that whatever we say today will still be true tomorrow. Thus, Archaeopteryx should be listed as one of those lines connecting the emergence of birds from dinosaurs, but Archie's picture should not be placed at that spot. And likewise, Darwin also predicted that we should find a fossil in Africa with features halfway between those of modern humans and the apes that were known in his day. And half a century ago, we found Lucy, an African fossil whose hands, feet, teeth, skull, pelvis, and other physical details all exactly match the missing link that Darwin predicted would be halfway into that transition. But does that mean that Lucy was our direct ancestor? We found maybe 400 samples of Australopithecus afarensis since then. Maybe we're descended from one of them. Even if we assume that our species emerged from hers, then considering the thousands or tens of thousands of afarensis alive at any one time, compounded over thousands of generations of which that species existed, what would be the odds against the very first fossil of that species we ever find being the body of our great to the tenth power grandmother? Not likely. It's far more likely that we emerged from another individual that was similar to her. And plus, there's always the possibility we might find another species from back then that is even closer to us, like Kenyanthropus platyops, for example. So Lucy and Kenyanthropus should both be listed with these lines, connecting to the emergence of humans, but their pictures should be with all of these other images along the top, rather than at the dividing notes. Though evolutionists point to a few examples, there should be thousands. And there are. And when I started my activism, I often cited an in-depth list of a few hundred definitely intermediate or transitional species, even according to the strictest definition of that word. But that list was from a quarter century ago, and we found a whole lot more transitional fossils since then. And someone else is updating that list, and now it numbers in the thousands. However, some species of untold millions of individuals are known only from a single jawbone because the process of fossilization is so rare. But it only takes one example to prove that avian feathered dinosaurs or half-human apes or semi-mammalian reptiles or four-legged whales really existed or that some fossil fish had legs like an amphibian. You only need one such skeleton to prove they existed and that they blur the lines between whatever kinds you've tried to keep divided. Genesis 121 says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Yeah, well, the Bible also says that God created Adam using a golem spell. And the Bible says that the sky is a solid mirrored dome, and that the sun inside that dome is smaller than the earth and that the moon is bigger than all the stars, and that the stars are all also inside that dome, fixed in the solid sky covering a flat disc-shaped earth. The Bible says a lot of stupid shit. The Quran does too, and so do a lot of other scriptures pretending to be the word of various gods or versions of God. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of the Godhead and creator of the multiverse, complained that there were already people back then promoting some idea of evolution, long before the book of Genesis was even written. From the beginning, God created fully formed kinds of animals. No, we have no reason to believe that any God ever existed outside of man's imagination. If you can't show that any God is even real, then how can you pretend to know such specific details about it? Remember that it is dishonest to assert baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact. You shouldn't say that anything is true if you don't have sufficient evidence to show the truth of it. I, however, have evidence enough to justify my statement that man created gods in his own image to explain a past he obviously didn't know anything about. So, it isn't a tree like Darwin thought. Instead, it's an orchard. No. 
A more accurate rendering might be the form of a bush, especially something like a tumbleweed. But it's definitely not an orchard, and we can prove that. Now look how vague Jane's illustration is. That's deliberate. Does it mean that wolves are a kind? Or canids? Or all carnivorans? Are chimpanzees a kind? Or does that mean great apes? What about lesser apes? Or does this mean to refer to all primates, apart from humans, of course? Are finches a kind? Or does that mean all birds? Or just passerine birds? Are triceratops a kind? Or does this refer to ceratopsians, or maybe all dinosaurs exclusively? If so, then how does that account for creationists thinking that birds are a separate kind from dinosaurs? Believers have to be as vague as possible for exactly the same reason your horoscope has to be as vague as possible, because that's the only way to keep from immediately disproving what they cannot admit is wrong. God created the different kinds of animals, and then they expressed all types of amazing variety as they bred within their kind. There evidently is no God, and there certainly is no such thing as a kind. And the way we know that is the phylogeny challenge, which I posted over a decade ago and which no creationist has ever answered in all that time. Here's how I explained it back then. Creationists usually accept that taxonomy is superficially accurate, but they'll only concede that to a degree, because they insist that their god miraculously conjured a series of definitely different kinds of animals which were each specially created separate from each other. Creationists allow that each of these kinds have since diversified, but only within mysterious limits which they refuse to originally define. And they say that no lineage could ever be traced beyond their alleged original archetypes. However, they're unable to identify what those kinds are, how many there are, or how they could be recognized. I would challenge them to show me their mystic divisions amongst the following taxa. Are mallards related to pockards, wood ducks, and muscovies? Are all ducks also related to geese and other anseriforms? Are anseriforms related to galliforms and other neonates? Are neonates related to paleonates? Are any extant birds related to Hesperornis, Ichthyornis, Enantiornis, or other Euronites? Are Euronates related to Confuciusornis or Archaeopteryx? Are all early aves related to Microraptor, Velociraptor, or other non-avian dinosaurs? Are dinosaurs related to pterosaurs, phytosaurs, and other archosaurs? If evolution from common ancestry is not true, and some flavor of special creation of different as yet unidentified kinds is true, then there would be some surface levels in the cladogram where you would accept an actual evolutionary ancestry. But there must also be subsequent levels in that twin-nested hierarchy where life forms would no longer be the same kind and wouldn't be biologically related anymore. At that point, they would be magically created separate kinds and distinctly unique from those listed around it, as well as those apparently ancestral to it. So, are Bengal tigers related to Burmese tigers and all other tiger species? Are all known species of tiger related to each other and all other panthers? Are all panthers related to felines, scimitar cats, and other felids? Are felids related to nymphorids or viverids? And how could we tell? Are all phylloidea related to any or all other members of the order carnivora? Those who promote creationism's bewildering inanity should be able to show exactly where and why uniquely created kinds could not be grouped together with any parent clades which would otherwise only imply an evolutionary ancestry. Throw away any other argument you might be thinking about. None of them compare to this. If creationism is true of anything more than a single ancestor of all animal forms, if not the entire eukaryote collective, or if the concept of common ancestry is fundamentally mistaken, then there must be a point in the tree where taxonomy falls apart, where what we thought was related to everything is really unrelated to anything else. And unless you're a Scientologist or Aurelian, that criteria must apply to other animals besides ourselves. So, is the short-tailed goanna related to the parenti and all other Australian goannas? Are all Australian goannas related to each other and to the African and Indonesian monitors? Are today's terrestrial varanids related to Cretaceous mosasaurs? Are varanids related to any other anguimorphs, including snakes? Are anguimorphs also related to skinkimorphs and geckos? Are all sclerogosa related to iguanids and other squamates? Are all of squamata related to each other and to all other lepidosaurs? Are all lepidosaurs related to placodonts and plesiosaurs? Are lepidosauromorphs related to archosaurs and other diapsids? Are all diapsids related to anapsids or synapsid reptiles like dimetrodon? Are all reptiles related to each other and all other amniotes? 
Are all amniotes related to each other in all other tetrapods? Are all tetrapods related to each other in all other vertebrates? And so on. Which of these are related? Which of these are created? Remember, if there's any validity to creationism whatsoever, or if there's some critical flaw in the overall theory of evolution from common ancestry, that flaw must be found here, or it simply can't be anywhere else. And recombining genetic possibilities that God packed into the original kinds produced that variety? Exactly. No, that is not what recombination is or how it works. These genetic possibilities ultimately come from mutations. That's an established fact, which John and Jane are not allowed to admit. We see variation happening all the time, but we've never seen the evolutionary process of mutations and selection creating new kinds. So dogs, apes, and people can show variety, but can never morph into a new kind. Yep, just like the orchard. One basic tree kind can never become another because there's no such thing as a kind. And there was never any time in evolutionary history when one kind of thing was ever supposed to have turned into or given birth to another fundamentally different kind. If you look at any depiction of any evolutionary lineage, all you will ever see are examples of descent with inherent modification, accumulating subtle variations, never one kind changing into another. That is just a straw man fallacy, a lie creationists tell each other so that they can accept what evolution is without admitting that what they accept is evolution. Scientists seem to name something a new species, even if there's only a minor change. And in the fossils, the smallest variation is classified as a different species, even though we see lots of variety with some species today. Like what? Like in dogs. Just think about all the variety in the breeds of dog kinds, Canis familiaris, in the last 200 years. If Canis familiaris is a kind, like Jane just suggested, that means that God created one pair of domestic dogs and that Noah took two such dogs onto his ark. And we derived all of our modern breeds from them. But that also means that wolves, Canis lupus, would have to be a different kind from dogs, even though they can still interbreed. So Noah would have to have had a pair of wolves on his ark, too. And then there are other wild dogs that are definitely dogs, even though they're not interfertile with Canis familiaris. The African painted dog, the Asian raccoon dog, the South American bush dog cannot interbreed with any breed of domestic pooch. So does that make them all different kinds? Meaning that Noah had to have a pair of each of them on board too? As well as a flurry of foxes and other fossil caniforms we haven't even mentioned yet? If future paleontologists dug up the bones of a bulldog, a chihuahua, and a Great Dane, they would surely classify them as three different species. That's true, because dogs are the product of artificial selection, where breeding pairs are kept separate in kennels or fenced-off yards, and historically only been allowed to mix selectively, with the intent or permission of breeders. That sort of thing doesn't happen in nature. So you would never see this level of variety within the span of only a few centuries. If these were the product of natural selection, then they would be genetically separated species just as quickly long before they could become this diverse. But they are all the same kind. I've tried asking creationists even the simplest questions pertaining to their notion of kinds. Like, can you tell me whether a wolfhound and a gray wolf, or a maned wolf, or an ard wolf, or a Tasmanian wolf are all the same kind? And more importantly, how could we tell whether any or all of them are different kinds? But no creationist has ever even attempted to answer any question pertaining to the phylogeny challenge. They won't even try because they already know that the devil is in the details that they don't even want to look at. They cannot define what a kind is because they already know there is no such thing. Whether beaks of a finch change shape or a color of a moth, the changes are limited. No, they're not. No such limitation has ever been indicated. This is Jane, or rather the script writers, again, making shit up that ain't true. When it's just expressing variety within the created kind. Yep. What do creationists think they mean when they talk about created kinds? Well, originally the argument was that speciation was impossible. And then when Darwin showed otherwise, creationists held to that notion that natural selection wasn't real and that speciation couldn't happen because it had never been observed. As if anyone had ever observed anything being created out of nothing by magic. 
But then believers realized that speciation had been directly observed and documented unambiguously so many times that even they couldn't deny it anymore. Then, with thousands of fossil species being discovered that contradicted Noah's Ark, they had to find some way to squeeze them all onto the Ark, even though world geography had already shown that there were a lot more species alive now than could fit into that boat. So they switched gears and tried to use evolution to explain how Noah got all of those species into his Ark. Now the story is that he didn't, that instead he only included a few created kinds. And when they got off the boat, then maybe 1,400 original kinds suddenly diversified into more than a million species over the next weekend or so. It had to be that fast because there was supposed to be a cat kind, for example, on Noah's Ark. But in the time of the alleged flood, there were already artistic renderings of modern lions and domestic felines. So creationists had to evoke evolution and not just macro evolution but a super-duper hyper-caffeinated electro-mega evolution on steroids and cocaine in overdrive in order to get from the maximum capacity of the imaginary arc to the vast array of regionally specific biodiversity seen around the world immediately thereafter. It's as if everything procreated like rabbits, with the offspring being you know, different species from the original form, and then when all of these new species got off the boat, they would have to board different vessels to be shipped off to their current homelands, and this was supposed to have happened at a time when Egypt was already in its fifth dynasty? So obviously we know that the global flood of Noah's Ark never really happened, nor could have. But creationists have to make up some excuse, any excuse, to still make believe in it anyway, regardless whether it's true or not. So evolutionists consider adjustments to existing traits evidence that evolution made those traits in the first place. So. What if God made each basic kind with potential to change some of its traits, but no potential to morph into a different kind? Don't you love a what-if question that has absolutely no evidence to support it, nor even a possibility to consider, and there's no way to test it, and the only reason to pose it in the first place is to deny reality and all of the evidence of the obvious real answer that we already know is correct? Dogs can breed with coyotes, and coyotes can breed with wolves. They call the kai wolf so they must all be part of the same created kind. So they have a common ancestor, but it was the original dog kind that God created, not the transition between a reptile and a mammal like they show in these textbooks. So fossils, the classification of animals, and the Bible are all in harmony. That's what it looks like. No, it doesn't look like that, not even remotely, nor could it. And don't forget that the Bible says that lobsters and whales are both fish and that bats are birds. And it says that there are multiple kinds of birds within what should be the one and only bird kind. And the only definition of a kind that the Bible ever gives is the Hebrew word min, being whether two animals are closely related enough that they can interbreed and bring forth fertile offspring. This definition precisely matches that of the biological species concept, such that a species and a kind should be the same thing. But believers want to move the goalpost to some higher taxonomic level, like uh, the genus or family level, or higher, where different genera cannot reproduce or bring forth anything anymore. So their newly revised concept of kinds contradicts what the Bible says, but they don't care about that. Their revised interpretation means that they actually accept that evolution happens and that even macroevolution happens, meaning variation at the level of species and above, including new genera and even new families, if necessary, depending on which creationist you're talking about, about what lineage. For example, Kent Hovind says that butterflies are a different kind from the rest of Lepidoptera. And he thinks that dogs and bears are different kind, no matter how similar they are, and despite the fact that they are genetically the same clade, and they have multiple fossil bear dogs to unite them. Hovind ignores all that evidence and says that his criteria is that a five-year-old should be able to tell you whether they are different kinds. Yet there have been times when whole families thought that the bear they adopted was just a dog. So that ought to prove that they are the same kind, right? Meanwhile, Ken Ham says that the elephant kind should involve the whole proboscidean order, which includes more than just elephants. But believers want to ignore fossil transitions and genetic phylogenies to pretend as if there is some limit to evolution that no biologist has ever been able to find any hint of. John and Jane and their script writers state as fact that these limitations exist, but they're just making up shit again, because whatever limitations they're trying to imply evidently do not exist. 
And that's why only young earth creationists, religious extremists, science denialists ever talk about that. Professional biologists know better. Well, all of that gives me an idea. What if we organize your makeup by kind? All the nail polish in one spot, all the eye stuff in another, and all the lip things elsewhere. That's brilliant! We do an orchard, not a tree. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? I'll tell you what it makes me think. The refusal of creationists to even define the term kind, and the refusal to investigate the alternative taxonomy that they themselves are proposing, makes me think that even they don't believe in biblical kinds. If they did, they would be able to show the truth of their claim, or at least accept the phylogeny challenge. Another way you could do that is to show four animals, two different species from the same kind and two other species from different kinds, that science would consider closely related to the first two from an evolutionary perspective, or at least as close as possible. I asked Kent Hovind for one such example of two kinds that science would consider closely related, and he said, an elephant and a pine tree trying to find two examples that were as far apart as he could imagine, because he's afraid of that challenge. All creationists are. Now, science would consider Serenians closely related to proboscideans, certainly a lot closer than pine trees are, but believers don't want to give appropriate examples because they're not trying to find out what the truth is. They're trying to pretend as if they already know it, even when they know they don't, and even when they know that we can prove that they don't. If you're going to argue for kinds at all, then you have to rigidly define that term. Otherwise, we'll be unable to consider whether there are kinds or not, because no one knows what you're talking about, not even you. Because if you leave the term undefined, then it is literally meaningless.